good afternoon or evening is close to it. And uh, my name is Curtis DeSales. I teach at NSU. I, I'm an anthropologist, but I also teach engineering. Uh, so it's kind of, I'm, I like to dabble in a few things. I want to, uh, today is Delta Foodways. We're going to talk about food. Yes, ma'am, if we can close the door. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about food today, and it's going to be a, ver a variety of t different types of food. We have uh, Miss Marjorie here, a Native American. We have everybody else here that have different kinds of food, and, and I'm sure some of the audience, we all know it and love food, right? Okay, I'd like to pass around the mic, and we're going to introduce ourselves, and I've introduced myself. So, Miss Marjorie, could you tell us a little bit about you and your name? My name is Marjorie Batiste. I'm from the Cushata tribe of Louisiana. The home office is in Elton, but I live in Kinder, which is 10 miles from it. I speak my own language, and I teach my children uh, Cushata language. Uh, a lot, the English people call it Cushata, but in Kwasati tongue, you say Kwasati. That's why when, when I have a booth out there, it says Kwasati food. And uh, I do fry bread. I do... Uh, it's like a hominy, but it's a dry uh, whole kernel that is pounded and made into a broth. You can add dry meat to it, and it's called yakchi in my language. I don't know what, how you would say it in English. And we also have chawaka, which is the same thing, but only this is plain. A lot of the elderly people like to um, eat chawaka and they don't add any salt or anything and that's their food for for the day thank you well thank you uh, now we have Miss Betty here okay uh, I taught school 43 and a half years from age 21 to 65 and when I retired I thought I was gonna travel and work in my yard and work up at church but somehow or another, I got sidetracked. My knees gave out, then my feet. So I started writing. Now this is my latest book here. It's uh, about mostly the stories that my mother told me. Uh, she was a storyteller. And so she, every time you went there, she would tell you stories. So I just started <laughs> recording them. And before I knew it, I've got shelves of stuff that I've collected. So. Uh, Anyway, I didn't want to come here because I was afraid I couldn't talk. I've been out of school a while. So I convinced my brother here, he's a school teacher also, if he would do most of the talking, and he agreed. And so this is uh, Jack or Joe or whatever you want to call him. <laughs> you can call me. I used to be a coach. You can call me any descriptive adjective in the world. Uh, I got elected mayor, and this lady said, Coach, and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, they're going to call you some words you've never been called. I said, sweet lady, if I do, I'll buy you a steak supper. <laughs> Anybody in the school administration or coaching, I see Coach Ober back there, even your friends call you some descriptive adjectives <laughs> that you have to look up sometime. Okay. My exhibit is right here. <laughs> so these other people talking about it, I've been on the other end of it. Now, but I've also lived in an era when you had to pick that peas, shell them, and cook them, or you had to take a gun, go out there and shoot it, and bring it back. Sometimes you had to gather. So I've been a part of all that world. I've had two grandmothers that had a matat rock. How many know what a matat rock is? Okay, a matat rock is a volcanic ash or rock on the bottom part for the grinding. And you had a smooth stone to rub it down. So you ground your corn, your pepper, or anything that uh, you know, we didn't have all the implements we had today. 
While we're talking about that, I'd like to run a little survey, and I'm going to give you about a long eight seconds to think about it. A very long eight seconds, so somebody to keep time. How many electrical appliances do you have in your kitchen related to cooking? How many got 10 or more? 10 or more? 15 or more? Hmm, y'all kind of backward. <laughs> okay, but I lived in an era where you had a matat rock and a pot and a frying pan. Yeah. So I've been there, watched my grandmothers, my beautiful aunts. Uh, I was just telling them, if you worked out in the field, you started at sunup at 10 o'clock, they would bring you coffee, water, and tea cakes. Now, the old joke says that at 10 o'clock, you'd bring a lot of buttermilk to feed them up so they wouldn't eat that much for lunch because that was a part of the pay. So in the afternoon at 2 p.m., they would re repeat it. If you went to visit somebody, you got coffee that you could take one cup and make 16. <laughs> and that, that ratio may be low. They would also serve you jelly cake, yeah, tea cakes, anything, but you had to have something sweet. Well, I better shut up. But, but when I went and visited my aunts, they would put you about that much coffee in a cup. Yeah. And you say, well, that's not very much. You remember this 16 to 1 ratio I told you about? I would get to talking, and I'd set it at the end of the porch, okay? And I'd get to talking to my aunts, and I'd say, hey, is that a new flower over there? And I'd be pouring that coffee out. <laughs> because I visited three or four in a bunch. I mean, I talked about if you drank that four cups of coffee, you wouldn't sleep for a week. So, but I, I'll turn it over. I'm sorry. I, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to, I was supposed to be introducing myself. And, uh, well, I'll make you some more time. <laughs> okay, you grant me a little more time? You see why I asked You go ahead and tell us about it. We'll give you another eight seconds. Another eight seconds. <laughs> Thank you. That's where you call me. My roommate, at this institution here, Daddy was a Baptist preacher, and I'd go visit with him down in Clinton, Louisiana. When it came 12 o'clock, Jimmy held his hand up. His dad stopped mid-sentence, half-sentence, whatever. He never added, uh, uttered another word. So if somebody gets bored or something, raise your hand. I understand what that means. Uh, <laughs> Hey, but she's done that to me. That's my beautiful wife. She's done that to me uh, many times. Uh, she says, I don't know when to shut up, and she's probably true. If I told you everything I knew, it would take 21 or 22 seconds. So, so let's get this established. Okay. The condiments and... In the household I grew up, and then my grandparents, you had salt, pepper, both black pepper, white pepper, and of all, red pepper. Okay? What did I say? Salt, pepper, garlic, and onions. And that's it, baby. Now, every house had a front porch and usually a back porch. When you walked and you looked at that porch, the first thing you saw was a string of red pepper strung up on string hanging up to dry. You also saw a card of garlic. Okay? And you also saw plated onions all looking at you. Okay, now, my grandparents, for some reason, were garlic fanatics. 
In fact, they gave me so much garlic, I don't even eat it today unless it's in a mild fashion. They put garlic in everything. They put garlic in their breakfast sausage. Believe it or not, you got some here on the front row, I'll tell you, I'm telling you the truth. So now, what do they cook in? Here. My grandmother did not have a stove. Mmm. You say, yeah. She cooked at the fireplace, didn't she? Okay, and if you cook at a fireplace, you must have cast iron. I see that beautiful lady in the back agree with me. She's so sweet and so nice and so agreeable. So, now, you had to have two. You had to have a skillet and a big pot, okay? Yes, sir. Well, how do you cook cornbread on an open heart? How many know how you do it? Oh, good. <laughs> Okay, you don't cook it over the fire, you pull the coals, which is a little past burnt, okay? You put that skillet on top of it. You put coals on top of the lid. The lid has a recessed place, okay? So if you, don't, if you want your cornbread to cook from the bottom and the top at the same time, you put the coals on top of the lid. Okay, any of your campers? All of the old nester campers use something close to that fashion. Okay, now I'm prior to cornbread mix, okay? I can tolerate cornbread mix <laughs> once a year, but that's about it. Okay, how do you make cornbread? I make cornbread without using my fingers. Use a spoon. I take two cups of cornmeal, preferably white. I take one cup of flour. I take two eggs. I take about mm, three tablespoons of shortening or whatever you're going to use, put it in that frying pan and heat it up. I mix that mixture I told you about with a cup and a half or so of milk or to your, the consistency you like where you can pour it out. I heat that all on top of the stove. Then I hate to tell you all this because I know it ain't good for you, but it sure tastes good. If you pour that meal mixture in that pan, it fries that bottom, don't it? Yeah, you get a crust on that cornbread to say, hmm, I remember my grandmother now. Okay, that takes up in today's market where you can cook at 400 degrees or 425. It's not like my mama's that didn't have no gauge other than the gauge that was in their head. So I set my timer at about 25 minutes on 400. I walk away in about 10 or 12 minutes again, I rotate that. Now, as soon as I get that cornbread out, my wife indulged in one of the favorite old-fashioned meals, cornbread and milk. Now, she likes hot cornbread and milk. I prefer cold cornbread and milk. How many of you have had it for supper only cornbread and milk? Oh. Mama liked it with buttermilk. She's a little different. Okay, now, going back to cornbread. One of our favorite, oh, I see my friend in the back. She knows what crackling cornbread is. Okay, now, I haven't had crackling cornbread in recent history because I don't want to pay no 14 or $15 a pound for the cracklings. 
When I grew up, cracklings was a byproduct. So they'd give them to you, you know. You know, but I, these people today don't know about that. What else did we do with cornbread? Did you make Did you make oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> okay, with corn and bread, we did what is called rosinier bread. You would go out right before the grain start getting dry and hard. And uh, what do you call that? Okay. Uh, you cut it off. Yeah, you cut it off. <laughs> you cut it off the cob or you grate it off the cob. You mixed it up close to what I said for cornbread. You put that in the oven and you bake it. Now, my strong suggestion is if you try this, do not invite friends because they'll be wanting to come back. <laughs> so, uh, Kush Kush, uh, uh, I don't want to because she said about the fried bread, so right. we had a bunch of that, so I'm not, I won't go there. Okay, well, the couscous is basically the same thing. You heat your oil up, yeah. and you pour the cornmeal that's wet, and it makes pretty good. But I'll tell you what, it puts some pounds on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's close to what we call hot water cornbread. Right, right. very similar. But there is no liquid in the couscous? No, there is. You take the milk. And you make just like cornbread, you make oh, cornbread, okay. and you take a pot with the hot oil, and you just keep stirring, stirring, stirring and stir it a lot because it'll granulate. And when it granulates, it's good. They use it with milk. And I used to put butter on it. Well, I gained about ten pounds right away. And I said, I'm gonna have to stop eating cookies. Yeah, something like grits. Right, it's like grits, oh, okay. but, it, but it's granulated, real okay. dry, but it's good. Okay, well, we talked about it. Now, uh, this is food that was maybe in the 1800s for your parents, your grandparents. Yeah. And we're going to go back a little further. Miss Marjorie here is a Cushata Indian, and she's, uh, her, her folks go back to 10,000 years ago. And uh, she has some fry bread, and she's going to tell us about how to make some fry bread. For the, for the fry bread, it's a plain flour uh, for a family of say like four to six of them you you put the flour in a, a bowl like this here at least maybe four or five cups and um, you add baking powder salt and water now most some of the native americans uh, around the uh, country in other states they use milk eggs and shortening in their uh, fry bread. But the Kushadis only use plain flour, baking powder, salt, and water. And they, they, uh, they knead it till it's, till it's uh, the consistency of, of like this one here, like a biscuit dough, you know. Does it rise? Uh, if you let it sit long enough, you know, it'll, it'll rise and get softened. So this has been sitting, uh, you know, all day in, in the air condition. But when I have it outside, it's so soft that it's, it's hard to, to handle. Now, did, uh, did the Native Americans have baking powder a long time ago? No, they didn't. You remember maybe your mother, your grandmother? Yes. So they just used the flour to without the baking powder. Right. Okay. And what else did this is the corn? Yes. What did y'all eat that with? What did you eat fried bread? We ate it plain. You didn't put syrup or jelly or, or, or something on it? No, we ate it plain. You oh, ate it plain. Okay. So that's where we did. We, we always did it a sweet something. Yeah. Right. Well, they had uh, the Anglos or the French had cattle, and so they got the milk. And Native Americans were not that lucky to have no. animals. They didn't domesticate a lot of animals. Right. So, but, uh, but it was sustenance, it was yeah. carbohydrates, uh -huh. and uh, you know, you, and it's good, you can see it, she has some right here. Yes, yeah, it's, it's ready. And yeah. uh, look at that, it looks uh -huh. good. Now, I'll tell you a little something in French, the French. This bread here, it's called fry bread in, for the Indians, but for my French people, we call it croxiole. My mother used to make homemade bread, and when the bread was left over, she would curl it up and 
do this, try it. Mm -hmm. And it's called croxiole. It's an old French term, a Louisiana French term. Well, when she rolled it up, did she put jelly or butter or something in it? Just I mean, like just that? Just rolled it up. Yes, ma'am. We were very poor. I mean, dirt poor. <laughs> we, sometimes we didn't eat for days and, and when I grew up. And uh, it was true. I mean, if the weather was bad, we couldn't hunt or fish. So we just didn't eat. And uh, I was, the nuns raised me up after a certain amount of time. I was raised with the, with the nuns, Catholic Church. But, um, and, but this, I eat bread like this just for sustenance. Uh, you just get flour somewhere. Flour is cheap. And uh, it, it, it'll hold you up. You know. And my mother used to always say she would take the, the pen, we call it pen levé, bread that's ri risen. And uh, we'd use that, and she would make a soup out of uh, greens from the yard and a little tiny piece of fat just to make the flavor. So we were real poor. And then, but that, that's a bread that sustenance, you know, you, it'll, it'll keep you going. Yes, uh -huh. we, we eat this in the morning. Uh, so the kids like it with uh, powdered sugar or honey, syrup, uh, jelly, uh, peanut butter. Oh, yeah. Peanut butter is their favorite, you know. In, in and honey. you put eggs in this one? Or do you? No. No, no eggs. No eggs. So it's, it's yellow because it's fried. Right. Okay. See, sometimes you'll see bread that's white, and if you fry it, I guess it becomes yellow. What, what meal do you serve that with? Day, morning, night? Yeah, breakfast, noon, breakfast. night. Oh. Snack. It's like a bread for the average person. Well, we used to have, uh, Mama would call it, I don't know if it's, Kleppes or crepes, some of that. In French, it's a fr French word, crepe, means crepe. And, and, but we always had something sweet on it. Right. <laughs> I mean, it had to have. Well, you see, that was the difference. Native Americans didn't use a lot of sugar. They couldn't eat granulated sugar, no sugar cane. So they didn't, right? They didn't have anything of sweet. And, uh, and they just didn't have it. So they grew up with, you know, just eating plain. They had flour, they had from different sources like corn, they were growing corn, no corn. Salt no salt. Now there's a trick that my ancestors used to tell me that if you wanted to make salt, you would uh, take hickory sticks and heat them up in a can or something and the black stuff that comes out of it is salt and it's true. And you take it, you put it in water and the black parts raises to the top and then you throw it out and you evaporate it and it becomes salt. So if you're ever in the woods and you need to have salt, take some hickory sticks and heat them somehow, and it'll make like a syrupy outside and put it in the water and evaporate it and you got salt. So, you know, they learned that a long time ago. Well, and then so, are you gonna let us have some later? Okay, at the end, we're gonna have some French, some fried bread. And we got some uh, tea cakes. No, oh, tea cakes also. And then, I remember, I'll tell you a little story about uh, the fried bread. We had a Caddo conference, which was an Indian conference, and the local, People that run the food in the, in the college, they don't want you to bring in outside food. So it was about three years ago, the cattle conference, you were there. We had donuts that were given to us by the company, and, we, and we, I had to find a way to tell them, you know, that we need to keep those, we need to eat. So I told them, I said, you're going to upset the Native Americans. It's fry bread, that's their culture. Donuts are fry bread. And that lady scratched her head, she says, oh, I don't want to do that. You, you, you can bring all the donuts you want in. And so, so that was my little story about the fry bread, you know, but, uh, but you know, I mean, that's, I had to find some way to, and then a long time ago, just thinking about how, t how technology you were talking about a long time ago that they don't do today. This is a true story. In my, in my town, in Marksville, Louisiana, I had a next door neighbor who was my mama's cousin. They were, TV had just came out. Nobody had a TV hardly. They just got one. Well, she was watching TV and the Pillsbury Dough commercial came out. Oh, she told her husband, Monsieur, Monsieur Joe, they called him Mr. Joe, you got to go to that store, get me some of them, that little man that come out the can. So he went over there and he said, oh, he said, I want the biscuits with the little man that come out the can. So she, he, she, the lady said, okay, Pillsbury dough, no problem. Gave him five cans. So brought it home, hit it, and they waited. The little man didn't come out the can. So she said, oh, that's defective. So he opened all the other cans, and they kept going. And so they come over to my house. I was a little kid. I remember this. And they said, well, we bought this to my dad. He said, we bought these cans of biscuit, and the little man don't come out the can. I wanted one of them. That keep me company when Joe's at work, you know? <laughs> and uh, so she, she waited, and my daddy said, oh, you got that wrong. You know, the little man doesn't come out the can. That's TV. 
Well, he said, you mean to tell me they put stuff that's not true on TV? <laughs> and, uh, and then she said, I can make my own bread and my own biscuits. She said, I don't need that then. So she wanted to get her money back. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, do y'all have any other food that we always well, use? Uh, I was just going to say that uh, my mama told me all these stories. In my book here, it's mostly my mama's stories. Where she said that you would cook like... Uh, like them, now they did have flour, but some people were too poor and they only had like what you could make out of corn that you grew. They could make tortillas. Yeah. And uh, we have these interviews that our people did in 1982, 83, and 84. And this lady, Elvie Perry, now some of these people here, my kin people, they will know who Elvie Perry was. She said that her husband, Henry, he probably would be 100 years old now if he was still living. She said that he never ate anything made out of flour, like a cake or biscuit. He was a grown man before he ever ate any. And then I was talking to this other man, and he said that when he was little, he's probably 85 or 86 now, he said that uh, they would have only on Sunday would they have biscuits or cake or something, and the rest of the week they ate cornbread or tortillas or something like that. Like you were saying, buttermilk and cornbread at night, yeah, or, or just milk and cornbread. And, that, and I, I said, mm, I'd rather just eat the cornbread by itself, you know. Uh, but the milk, I just, yeah, I never liked milk. I just I don't know why. I, never, I never did either. But listen, let me tell y'all something else about my mother said that when they went to school, that they didn't have lunch rooms like we have today. She said that they had a little bucket, I guess, you know, a syrup bucket is what we call it. She said they would take whatever they had the night before, peas or beans, and she said if they didn't have anything left over, they would take a piece of cornbread or biscuit and pour syrup in it. And she said that was their meal. I think it was steam no. syrup? Yeah. Steam syrup. Yeah. Well, these uh, uh, tea cakes we have over here, this one lady made them, and she's 91 and a half, and she said you had to have steam syrup in that's there. What, that's what they, I was told. I was told. <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it was a yellow can. Yeah. Do y'all eat sorghum? Eat what? Sorghum molasses? Yes, but that was, that was about third rank. Uh, sugar, sugar cane syrup was number one. Yeah, my granddaddy uh, just had sorghum. Sorghum is, hey, I'll take some right now. <laughs> but uh, my daddy liked syrup, and we had syrup 365 days a, a year, okay? And the measure of how you measure if syrup is good in the wintertime when it's a little bit cool, if you stand a spoon up in there and that spoon salutes you back, you got good syrup. <laughs> now, sometimes that syrup was so thick that you couldn't, we called it sop with a biscuit. Yeah, you couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, now, but y'all, I gave y'all, you know, my exhibit A here. <laughs> uh, I could never, uh, eat that syrup and biscuit by itself, I had to have some good old homemade butter with it. And, and mix them up. Now, you say, well, y'all, you ain't talking about nothing. Our family unit reflected the total size and that we lived on lagoons most. Peas and beans. Peas and beans. You had peas one day, beans the next day, then you switched to farmland and you went maybe back to beans and then peas. Okay, you say, well, why did they use them? Okay. The savior of the South after the Civil War was black-eyed peas. Okay. Had it not been for black-eyed peas, we, those of us that are Southerners, we wouldn't be here. Okay, we went uptown and we got a second species of peas called the pink eye purple oil. Here. Now, in our household, you never cooked a pea or a bean without a hammock 
smoke pork bone. Uh, if times were really bad, we went, we went yeah. and got that dry salt. Now, if you don't know what dry salt is, that's a piece of fat about this thick, okay, with a rind on it, okay? We had a couple great uncles that every day about this time, they'd get them a piece just about this square. They'd score it here. They'd boil it. Hmm. And when they got it where they wanted to get a little of that salt out, I'm a They fried it. Can, they, can, can, you think, can you think of anything? You know, they didn't think about calories. They didn't think about saturated fat. They ate them with biscuits and syrup 360 days a year. And they all lived to be 90. Yeah. And walked to town, which was seven or eight miles away. Well, they didn't sit watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have a TV. Yeah. They, they didn't have no technology other than the basic. Okay. Now, our community, we did not adapt after the Civil War. Port is king, and pork is still king in that neighborhood. That's right. Yeah. Huh? That's right. Even the man in the bypass will tell you. <laughs> uh, There's no way you could be invited anywhere to eat, and pork was not in that menu somewhere. Uh, we finally got, to, we learned that you can have pork and not fry it. <laughs> Okay, when you butchered a pig, now this is against today's wisdom, okay? They would take a chopping axe and go right down where the ribs join the backbone. Ooh. And they would cut that straight through, which is point line, isn't it? Okay, all the country people, as soon as they got that out, they chopped it up and they did what? They made a gravy with it instantly or cooked it with rice. Okay, you say, well, you still got them ribs. The backup plan was fried pork ribs. And listen, friend, I'm telling you, if you didn't serve that and you were a young wife, you could have got a divorce on the ground that. Uh, now, so, so pork, now, before refrigeration, my papa would kill one in about, uh, what's the French word for it when you? Boucherie? Boucherie. 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 Huh? Like boucherie or? Yeah. Like Where they just when you kill them, they use every part of the pig. Oh, okay, when you divide it with your friends, what oh. is that called? Uh, when you divide it? Yeah. We didn't have a word for that, but we just <laughs> used the boucherie and uh, we had a boucherie, which, which we used every part of the pig. Now, the family was communal. They would grow all the pigs on the same land, and then they'd, you know, they'd split it. Yeah. We, you know, we didn't have a specific word. I'm sure somebody does. But, uh, but the way we preserved our hogs after we killed it is we, t we had a big crock pot, a big made out of uh, ceramic, and they made it with clay. And they'd put uh, fat, uh, you know, uh, rancid-like type fat from the, from the pig. Like, and it was flowing. And you'd take your meat and you'd barbecue the meat a little bit and you'd stick it way in there and it would last forever, last years and years. There's no, back, there's no oxygen for the bacteria. So when in the middle of winter, you would take it out, cut a piece off of it, wash it, you know, and re cook it on the pit, pit and it was just perfect. We, we preserved hogs, I mean, two or three wild hogs like that in a big pot. You had meat all winter. You know, I'm 56, and I'm, I'm 56 years old, but where I grew up, it was, you know, it was like that. And we didn't have much technology. And to, I, I love technology. I'm an engineering professor, but uh, still, I, I, we, I grew up in the time when we didn't have anything. Right. But that's, Did y'all ever kill them right out of the wild? Oh, yeah. Well, if it's a male, you can't do that. You have to cut, you have to castrate it and feed it maybe something for a few days or weeks. Or, and, but the female hogs, you kill it and eat it right then. And we'd stick it in that grease. And I tell you, it, does, it was perfect. perfect. It didn't smell anything. And you know, you just wash it off and with hot water. And you didn't salt 
And you, we didn't salt it. No, didn't need to. You could. You could, and you could have preserved it dry with salt or smoked. But on, under that grease, it never goes bad. For years, three, four years, it never goes bad. The oxygen stays away, so there's no bacteria. And, and tell, tell them about the smokehouse. Okay. Okay. A smokehouse is exactly what it says. You would, uh, you would cure meat two ways. You could cure it with salt, or you could sugar cure it. Both of them are preservatives. So you would put a layer of salt in a pasteboard box, a layer of bacon, yeah, or whatever you wanted to do, another layer of salt, stack them up, put them in a dry place, and I think we've done them nine days. How many did y'all do it? Six days? Okay, so I, I, don't, I know my father-in-law, he did it nine days, the same as we did. I, I don't know why we did nine, but anyway, you'd take that meat out, you'd put it in a wash pot of boiling water to get some of that salt out. And uh, we, we had a grass, a native grass indigenous to around here. And uh, my papa would get, go, I'd go with him, we cut it. It looked like it's palmetto somewhat. Yeah, they call it bear, bear. bear grass. So that was our terminology for it. We'd bring it back, get a little ditch, and, and build a fire in it, and kind of scorch that bear grass. And then that bear grass wasn't burned, so you could hang meat with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the insects didn't bother too. No. So, so then you would build a small, small, and the meat usually was about four or five feet from the fire. So it only got to smoke. Uh, a lot of people use fruit wood, but we and me and my papa, we always use hickory for some reason. Hickory was the choice. Now, all you people that barbecue, I know you use peach, you use apple, you use all that. I, today I use pecan because I got a pecan orchard right across my house and those limbs fall and I go get them and chop them up. So, but it's all. Now, that, that cured meat would stay there until, what's the name of the bug that gets in it? Yeah, well, he called it maggots, I'd be, uh, yeah, it's a larva that gets in it, so when it gets about April or May, you got to start doing something with it. Well, the oil really lasted forever. Yeah. It was looked pretty bad, but it still worked. Okay. Let me get the floor to Miss Margie, do you have anything to say about uh, how, you, how you would eat when you were young, when you were growing up, or your grandparents? What would y'all eat? My grandmother raised uh, hogs and uh, cows uh, and horses. That's all she had. Uh, and then uh, we had a rice farmer that would uh, lease the land and farm on her land. And whatever, um, whenever the rice was ready to uh, harvest, they would uh, cut it and give her uh, a sack of rice that was for, you know, for the payment and, and right. you know, like using, she, like sure. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in my father's time, uh, he, uh, he had the, you know, the chickens, the guineas, the ducks, the uh, hogs. So a lot of yes. wildlife, I mean just common yeah. domestic Right, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. And, and he grew a lot of corn, cotton, and peas, and... So basically uh, it wasn't so much different than... Right, uh-huh. Okay, well, I want to uh, open the floor for... We have a few minutes left. I want to open the floor for questions for either of these people or me or whoever. Yes, sir. Could y'all tell us about hot tamales? You tell them. 
He's the top. Okay. Hatamali is uh, trying to think, equated with something in today. It's an Indian Mexican blend. Okay. You start off with uh, very seasoned pork meat. My friend Dick Sepulveda that made uh, tamales commercially, he only used hog jowls. Now, you say, why that? Because I'm here telling you, the more fat you got, the better off they are. Hog jowls are 60% lean, 40% fat, okay? Now, I've heard by the grapevine that Dick's out of the business, so I'm sorry to hear it. But you would grind the pork down, season it, with uh, salt, pepper, and garlic, and lots of red cayenne pepper, lots, okay? You would take a corn shuck, yeah, okay, I see it. You would take a corn shuck and boil it. You would take uh, cotton meal, corn meal, and make a paste out of it. You would take the Cornmeal paste, paste it on the uh, shuck. You would wrap it, and then you would cook it. Now, there's two ways of making tamales. Some people make tamale with the raw meat. My family never made it with the raw meat. Yeah, we, we, we cook the meat first, put it in our tamale, then you only had to uh, boil it for so long. Now, that's still a viable entry, uh, industry in my hometown. Now, when I grew up, you could buy them for 40 cents a dozen. Okay? <laughs> that 40 cents a dozen today is eight or nine dollars a dozen. And they, they asked me, how do you know what a good tamale is? Years ago, before all this paper introduction, they wrapped them up in newspaper. Yeah. Okay, I said, if that grease comes through there, that paper, and it's red, it's good. I recommend them from afar. <laughs> okay. I think, hey, uh, Robert, do we have uh, no time left? Three or four minutes? Okay, one more question. Okay, uh, I ended my teaching career in the four-year-olds, and we always had show and tell. So I'm showing you, I didn't make them, and I have the recipe here for the tea cakes. That, that really was something when we were young, because we didn't get tea cakes very often. So that was something. I didn't make them. One lady that made them is 91 years old, and she made them yesterday. And then I have a friend that made the others. So I thank all of you for coming, and we appreciate it. I got one more word. <laughs> Any of you watch the Food Channel? Oh, yeah. Food Channel? Okay. They got this show, Can You Beat Bobby Flynn? <laughs> I can beat Bobby Flynn, and I'd like to have me a peach switch to do it with. <laughs> Well, I want to thank all our panelists and uh, everybody in the audience. We had a good turnout today. And uh, if you, you can talk to them after we finish here, and we'll go ahead and call it a, a good session. Thank you.